Welcome back to the playlist on free radical physiology and biochemistry. In this video, we're going to go over the production and the destruction and physiology and biochemistry of this molecule right here, which is called superoxide. And the very first thing you should notice about superoxide is that it's very similar to molecular oxygen, except it has an extra electron. And in the previous video, we looked at one enzyme called NADPH phagosome oxidase, which was one enzyme that could produce superoxide, and that particular enzyme is used in things like respiratory burst, which is used to kill cells. Um, but there are certainly other enzymes that can make superoxide. So, for instance, that one that we talked about was NADPH phagosome phagosome oxidase, and of course that requires NADPH, but another type of enzyme that can produce this is one of the enzymes that possesses an, a cytochrome P450 type of mechanism. So for example, cytochrome P450 enzymes are capable of producing superoxide, in fact they do it in the middle of their mechanism. Also another type of enzyme that produces superoxide in its mechanism is called nitric oxide synthase, which mechanistically is very similar to cytochrome P450 enzymes. Okay, And there are certainly many other enzymes that can produce superoxide, and the actual process of release of superoxide by these enzymes is called toxification. So some enzymes can actually produce these toxic uh, molecules, and you have to have a way to get rid of them. It turns out the way you get rid of superoxide is by this enzyme shown here, which is superoxide dismutase. Okay, and the reaction sequence is shown right here, and the majority of this video is really going to be um, to look at the mechanism of this enzyme. And what we're going to get out of this enzyme is molecular oxygen shown right here, and then also hydrogen peroxide. Now, in most cases, when we look at enzyme mechanisms, um, they can involve some metal ions, which would make part of their mechanism inorganic. Um, but we've never seen one up to this point that's purely inorganic. So remember what organic means is that the mechanism involves carbon. But see, this is a very unique enzyme because we're not acting on any substrates that have carbon. So we're only acting basically on hydrogen, oxygen, and metal ions. Okay, specifically the two metal ions that are used in the catalysis are a zinc ion that's used to stabilize a histidine residue and then also a copper ion which is used in the catalysis. And this particular type of superoxide dismutase is the most common one. It's the one that's found in all eukaryotes and we're going to look at which particular superoxide dismutases use this type of catalysis. But the important thing to realize is that this mechanism is purely inorganic. We're only doing simple electron transfers and proton transfers. That's it. Okay. Um, like I said, we have several enzymes that produce superoxide, whether it's through their catalysis completely or whether it's toxification so we can produce this. So we have to have a way to get rid of it, and it's through superoxide dismutase. Now, there are several types of superoxide dismutase. They're labeled 1, 2, and 3. These are the superoxide dismutases that exist in eukaryotes. There are some that exist in prokaryotes and different other types of organisms. And they may not use these exact metal ions. However, in superoxide dismutases 1 and 3, they're going to use the mechanism that I have written above, which we'll look at in a minute. They use a zinc ion to stabilize a histidine residue, and they use a copper ion for the catalysis. Okay? Superoxide dismutase 2, which is found in the mitochondria, uses manganese to do the same catalysis. Also, superoxide dismutase 1 is in the cytosol, but we also have one that exists in the extracellular fluid because we can also get superoxide production out there. That's superoxide dismutase 3. Okay, so just some other things about superoxide dismutase. We have this quantity that we can define and it's basically called catalytic efficiency. And mathematically, it's defined as the K-cat, or the turnover number of the enzyme, divided by the Km of the enzyme. And it turns out that superoxide dismutase actually has the highest catalytic efficiency of any enzyme in nature. So this is an extremely efficient enzyme. 
um, if it's very it's a very fast enzyme and the only limitation to this catalytic efficiency is actually the enzyme running into superoxide and so because of that we say that this particular enzyme is diffusion controlled so assuming there were a lot of superoxides around it's going to have really high catalytic efficiency but again you're not going to run into superoxide molecules all the time so we say it's diffusion controlled but in any case one important thing about superoxide that's important to understand is that it's able to um, it's able to destroy energy metabolism in terms of the TCA cycle so we have this enzyme in the TCA cycle called aconitase um, some important things to know about aconitase is that it is an iron sulfur protein the key thing here is that it has iron okay this is a non heme iron because it belongs to the iron sulfur center not a heme okay now when superoxide uh, binds to this enzyme it destroys the enzyme and so this is a key enzyme in the TCA cycle in fact it's the one that comes directly after citrate synthase so if this enzyme is destroyed you basically lose out on all the energy production of the TCA cycle and when aconitase gets destroyed it releases the iron from the active site okay and the iron when it gets loose it can undergo all sorts of redox reactions it can bind to DNA um, damage all sorts of proteins and of course it can damage DNA when it binds and the big problem with iron is that it, it's toxic because it can do all sorts of redox reactions iron is one of those transition metals that likes to cycle between oxidation states the two most common of course being the ferrous iron which is the two plus oxidation state and the ferric iron which is the three plus oxidation state iron can also go through other oxidation states these just happen to be the most common and you don't want that iron just floating free floating willy-nilly because it will do this so to bypass all of that you got to get rid of superoxide before it gets to aconitase and like it we've been talking about the way you do it is through this enzyme superoxide dismutase okay so we've gotten a little bit of detail on this we know that superoxide is generated purposely uh, by enzyme by cells doing respiratory burst but it's also produced doing toxification so let's learn how to get rid of it so basically here's sort of our setup for this enzyme we have this very important histidine residue in the active site the shift base component of the histidine is coordinated to the zinc by the way when I draw these yellow lines these are not covalent bonds these are just representing some kind of electrostatic interaction um, they could be as strong as a coordinate covalent bond but they are not physical bonds they're not covalent bonds they're just electrostatic in nature and then this nitrogen is actually going to start out in the deprotonated state and it's going to interact electrostatically with this copper ion okay now here's something that's important to understand um, this copper ion being in the 2 plus state is very important for its interaction with this nitrogen shown right here okay when the copper gets out of that 2 plus state and the nitrogen gets out of the deprotonated state the interaction between these guys actually fails okay and so they don't interact as strongly so there's also a hydronium here in the active site so this is hydronium okay that's going to be used for the catalysis also there's a zinc ion here here's what happens like we mentioned the shift base here interacts with the zinc and you have to realize that this histidine residue all of this business in here it's aromatic so it's planar okay so to prevent the histidine from kind of rotating around this axis right here this zinc coordinates the shift base and so it stabilizes the histidine in one plane and so that allows also this nitrogen in the deprotonated state to interact with the copper if this zinc was not here this histidine would kind of rotate around this axis right here and it would destabilize the mechanism of the enzyme okay and the other thing is that um, not only is this going to require one superoxide it'll actually require two for complete catalysis so the first thing that happens is you have this superoxide here in the active site okay so the very first step is we're going to generate molecular oxygen 
and the way this is going to work is I'll, do, I'll draw the mechanistic steps in green. This electron right here of, as part of the superoxide is going to be donated to the copper cation. Okay. Now notice something. Notice that I, di I didn't draw the complete arrow. I drew a fish hook arrow. And the reason I draw a fish hook arrow, think back to your organic, that's because I'm only transferring one electron at a time. If I had a nucleophile, which was, trans which was transferring basically two electrons, I would draw the arrow like that. But since this is only a one electron transfer, you have to draw it as a fish hook arrow. Now, whenever this electron is transferred to the copper, um, the interaction between the copper 2 plus, now it's copper 1 plus, right, because it got an electron, is compromised with this histidine, and so they dissociate. Okay, so the copper no longer interacts strongly with the nitrogen here, and so the nitrogen then comes off and it abstracts a proton from this hydronium, generating a water in the active site. Okay, and that water will eventually be replaced with another hydronium. Okay, now this this proton transfer right here is forming a physical bond. And if you think about it, the reason that this proton transfer occurs is when the copper 2 plus gets into the 1 plus state, when it receives that electron, it no longer interacts strongly with this nitrogen. Remember I said that this 2 plus state was very important for that binding. So now what you have after the first mechanistic step is you've generated molecular oxygen right here, and now you have this histidine in the protonated state. This is how you would find it at a physiological pH. This is one tautomer of histidine. So now at this point, two things are going to happen. Number one, and I'm going to, again, draw the mechanistic steps in green, this copper 1 plus is going to donate one electron to this atom of molecular oxygen. Okay, And as soon as it does that, this lone pair on this atom of oxygen is going to reabstract this proton from the histidine. Okay, and that's going to regenerate the anion of this particular nitrogen atom right here. And basically, since we, since we donated an electron from this copper 1 plus, notice in the next picture it becomes copper 2 plus. And so this copper 2 plus, once again, can interact very strongly with this anionic nitrogen on the imidazole ring. And so again, we have this strong interaction, but that only takes place when the electron gets donated from the copper 1 plus. And then, of course, we get proton transfer. Also, this lone pair right here, one of these lone pairs, is going to abstract a proton from a series of water molecules that are in the active site. So when this proton gets transferred onto the oxygen right here, then this bond breaks and then this proton transfer occurs and then you get a series of proton transfers until finally it terminates with this effective hydroxide abstracting a proton from this hydronium and you regenerate a series of water molecules okay and then if you look at the final products now you have this copper 2 plus interacting strongly with the anionic histidine right here and again I've drawn the electrostatic interaction in yellow and then, of course, you get the final products, which I'll circle in purple. You get hydrogen peroxide and you get molecular oxygen. Okay. Now, what's important to realize is hydrogen peroxide is also toxic. <coughs> Excuse me. So the hydrogen peroxide, we'll talk about this in the next video, but the hydrogen peroxide can, can do several reactions. Okay. I'm not going to go into excruciating detail here. But effectively, if hydrogen peroxide is left unchecked, it could do a homolytic bond cleavage, in which case you generate two of these guys, which are called hydroxyl radicals. Okay, So notice this hydroxyl radical is not hydroxide, because with hydroxide, this oxygen would have a negative charge. Here the oxygen is neutral overall because it has this free radical on it. And that free radical is tremendously reactive, and you don't want those floating around. So you would think that you'd have an enzyme to get rid of hydrogen peroxide, and it turns out that you do. And that enzyme is called catalase. Catalase. It's one of the fastest enzymes known to man. And we'll talk about what that yields in the next video. Okay, but what I want to do before we 
conclude with this video, I want to think about some of the things that superoxide could do. And I'm going to use one example here that's really important in biochemistry. Um, one of the things that we can produce in, in nature is nitric oxide. And if you look at the molecule of nitric oxide, it's very small. This nitrogen is in a double bond to this oxygen, but what's really important is that this nitrogen has one lone pair and then it has one lone electron. So notice that this is actually a free radical. And that's very unusual because we normally don't think of you know, highly useful molecules as being free radicals. In fact, this is the only one I can think of off the top of my head. So nitric oxide is a naturally produced molecule. It's made by nitric oxide synthase from arginine and a few NADPHs and molecular oxygen. And nitric oxide, when it's released, it causes things like vasodilation. It's important in sexual function for both males and females. It, of course, dilates blood vessels, which is important in normal physiology, um, you know, before you start, you know, coagulating and so forth if you get an injury. So this is a really important molecule. But it is actually prone to being spontaneously reactive with superoxide. So let's think about how that might occur. So let's draw a molecule of superoxide. This is going to be the oxygen atom, which has the uh, full octet on it. And then I'm going to draw the other atom of oxygen, which, of course, is the radical. Now, superoxide is a lot more reactive than molecular oxygen. Okay? And it turns out what happens is you can get a coupling reaction. So again, I'll draw the mechanistic steps in green. So this particular lone electron, again, I'm drawing fishhook arrows, can couple with that electron on the superoxide. And so what you get is this guy right here. So you get nitrogen in a double bond to, to an oxygen atom. That's just the nitric oxide component. But now you get this right here. And again, this particular oxygen has a negative charge on it. And this molecule has a special name. It's called peroxy, peroxy nitrite. And peroxy nitrite is incredibly dangerous. Um, it's dangerous because it's extremely electrophilic. So, for example, this atom of nitrogen right here is tremendously electrophilic. Because, for example, if I have some nucleophile right here, if I have a nucleophile, and certainly those are present in DNA, this nitrogen is fairly exposed. There's no, there's no carbon atoms, there's no hydrogen, nothing blocking it. So it's tremendously electrophilic because what can happen is a nucleophile can attack here and that can basically force some kind of nucleophilic acyl substitution or it can just create some kind of adduct, okay, where this molecule gets covalently bonded to the nucleophile or, of course, you can get the acyl substitution and you can get loss of some kind of reactive species over here. So peroxy nitrite can react with DNA, it can react with proteins, it can react with lipids sometimes. It's very, very dangerous. And so to prevent peroxy nitrite formation, you have to get rid of superoxide. <coughs> Excuse me. And by the way, I think I mentioned it already and hopefully it was a little bit intuitive to you. This reaction of nitric oxide reacting and coupling with superoxide, this is non-enzymatic. Okay? There's no enzyme that does this, at least anyone knows. Sometimes you'll hear reactions listed as non-enzymatic as spontaneous. Um, technically, they do have a negative delta G associated with the reaction, but what we really mean by spontaneous is we mean they're non-enzymatic. So if a nitric oxide is floating around and it comes in contact with a superoxide, this reaction is known to occur and you'll get peroxy nitrite, which again is very detrimental to cells. And in the next video, what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at the reaction of catalase, and we'll find that it's actually one of the fastest enzymes known to man. So just remember, superoxide dismutase, you use two superoxide molecules, and then you get out molecular oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on this enzyme. See you in the next video.